Hi, it's Pastor Mark Johnson, Life Tabernacle Church in Elkhart, Indiana, with tonight's uh, Bible study on soul winning. We've been talking about discipleship. You can't have disciples without winning someone to God. And so we've been talking about soul winning last week, this week, next week. We're going to talk about um, people in Scripture who were soul winners, people that were in and around Jesus, followers. And um, today we want to talk about Andrew, who uh, was a follower. Jesus called to him and said, come and follow me. So he was a follower, and he's also a connector. He had, um, his phrase was, come and see. Come, come see what the Lord is about. Come see what the Lord is doing. Come and see a man. Come and see someone who uh, knows and understands. Come and see someone who can do a miracle in your life. Come and see someone who is the Messiah, the answer to all of our prayers. Um, so we're going to talk about that tonight. I hope that you'll stay with me through the Bible study and um, we'll gain by that. You'll grow by that. You'll uh, feel uh, a hunger or authority or power to do more than you've ever done before. I'm going to ask you to pray as we get started opening the Word of God. Open our hearts to uh, hear the Word of the Lord and touch us. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for your great grace and abundant overwhelming mercy. I pray, God, that your spirit and your anointing would rest upon us. God, that you would open our hearts and our minds to hear what thus saith the Lord, and then you would speak to us. I pray by your power, by your anointing, open our, our spirit to receive from you. I thank you for that, and I trust you for that. So, Andrew, we're going to read from uh, Luke chapter 16, verse 19 through 31. There was a certain rich man, clothed in purple and fine linen, fared sumptuously every day. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried away by angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torment, seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. What a tragic circumstance he found himself in. Verse 24 says, He cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy upon me. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember thou that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, the rich man speaking, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify to them, lest they also come into this place of torment. And Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded though one rose from the dead. What a powerful statement. Um, what, what, first of all, a foolish statement. The man who never followed advice, never listened to preaching, never responded, never obeyed, never followed, never changed, is um, coming up with a way that he thinks that his brothers are going to change. It's as if he's saying, well, if I would have had that, I would have changed. And Abraham, knowing better, said, no, if they're not going to listen to the preachers, if they're not going to listen to the prophets, if they're not going to read the commandments and obey the commandments, 
than one risen from the dead, a, a parlor trick is not going to save them. Some mystical hocus pocus, boom, your brother's alive or Lazarus is back from the dead. And they'll say, well, I don't think that's true. I, I think he probably wasn't dead. It's a trick. Somebody's trying to fool us. That's his brother. That's his cousin. That's his twin. That's, that's some way that mankind will always find a way not to believe. I'll say that again. Mankind will always find a way not to believe. Um, you can also say that mankind will always find a way to believe if that's what they want to do. If you want to believe, there's nothing that can take your faith away. Um, you can live in the streets. You can live outside of a rich man's house. You can beg from the table. And you can just eat crumbs while he's eating delicacies. You get the crumbs that fall off the table and you can go to heaven. So regardless of the circumstance, regardless of the difficulty, regardless of the problems, regardless of the heartaches, regardless of the trials, regardless of your position in the world, regardless of how many people look down on you, regardless of how many hiss at you or turn away from you because you smell and didn't get a bath in time, regardless of how people treat you, there's still a place in heaven that God would receive you. What a great hope and promise for Lazarus. What emptiness for the rich man. And he wouldn't hear. And he wouldn't respond. He wouldn't listen. And now he can't be changed. But he wants his family to be changed. The idea that, that there is a heaven and that there is a hell, I think is clearly laid out in Scripture. There's been an effort recently, and even in Christianity, to discount heaven. Uh, even some well-known, very large uh, church pastors have uh, begun saying, well, I don't really believe that there is a hell. And one really has gone so far as to say, well, everybody's going to go to heaven. It's, it's just a given. God loves us so much, everybody gets to pass go, collect $200, and don't worry about going to jail. But that's not really what the Scripture bears out. Scripture bears out that there's a heaven to gain and a hell to avoid, to uh, uh, flee from. Uh, the New Testament says, flee youthful lusts. Well, if you don't need to flee youthful lusts, if you can follow youthful lusts and still go to heaven, then why would you flee youthful lusts? Why would Jesus say... Uh, that if you follow me, if you love me, you're going to keep my commandments. And uh, if, we, if he loves us so much, then why would we have to keep his commandments? He can love us when we don't keep his commandments. And he's going to save us when we don't keep his commandments. But clearly that's not a biblical concept. That is uh, wishful thinking at best and um, condemnation to those who believe it and are going to find out in the end that that's not the way the scripture works. That's not the way God works. God is holy. When to worship him, we must worship in holiness. The Bible says we worship in spirit and in truth. And he is holy, and he is expecting us to be holy. So there is a heaven to gain and a hell to avoid. This scripture is very clear about that. If you look in Luke chapter 15, verse 7 and verse 10, it says, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth. Moreover, the ninety-nine just persons which need no repentance. Verse 10 says, Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. So heaven responds when people recognize that they're, they have sin and when they flee from that sin, when they repent. Repentance is not just, I'm sorry, but I'm sorry, I'll make restitution and I'm not going to act that way again. I'm not going to lie again. I won't cheat again. I won't murder again. I, I'll stay away from adultery or idolatry or whatever the sin is. I want a life change. I want to be more like Christ than I am today. And so I'm going to grow in grace and knowledge 
with the Lord. And so it's a change of nature that he came and died on the cross. Really doesn't make sense that he would come and die on the cross for us to stay the same as we've always been. He came to see us receive his spirit and be changed by the power of his spirit. So uh, the rich man had two concerns in hell. First of all, he was concerned about how he felt. He felt tormented. He was in pain. He asked for Lazarus to dip his finger in the water and put it on his tongue to give him just a moment of relief because he was in such intense pain. Um, hell cannot be described in a positive manner. It just cannot be described in a positive manner. There's, and I'm not going to spend a great deal of time on it, but Scripture talks about the torment of hell. And then he had an awareness, an awareness of where he was, but also awareness of where his family was. And he did not want his brothers. He loved his brothers, but he didn't want his brothers to come here. And he was in fear that they were going to follow his example and that they were going to come and spend their eternity in hell. So he came up with a plan. I'm going to send Lazarus back. If you would do that, Abraham, it's going to solve all my problems. Abraham, being a little wiser and having known God and followed God and become a father of the faithful, realized that, that that's a fool's errand, and then it wouldn't do any good because they'd find those excuses. But he did have, he did have that awareness enough to have two concerns. So what we're talking about today is not heaven and hell, but you have to lay that groundwork to think about the work that we do as a church. If, we're, if there's no heaven or there's no hell or there's no hell and there is a heaven, then why should we even worry about it? Let's just go golfing. Let's uh, have a great time. Tennis or, or stay home and crochet or do your yard. Come up with the, the uh, championship roses in your yard on a Sunday morning. Don't come to church if it's not important. But if it is important, isn't it important just more than you, more than me, that we have an opportunity to go to heaven? What about all the people that we drive by? What about all the people that we live by? What about all the people that we work by? Uh, shouldn't we be concerned about them? Is that not a weight that we should carry? If you look at 1 John 40 and 42, uh, the Bible says, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard that John had said, uh, or heard what John had said, and, and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. So Andrew was an early adopter. He had heard about uh, John the Baptist. He went out to see. He followed John the Baptist. He was a disciple of John the Baptist. Maybe he washed the towels after baptismals were over with. Or maybe he helped people into or out of their robes as they were getting ready to get baptized. Or uh, whatever it was he did, fix dinner for John the Baptist. Whatever it was, a locust and honey. Whatever it was that he did as a follower of John the Baptist, when John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the whole world, Andrew said, Well, that's a guy I'm going to follow. That's the guy he's been preaching about, and so he is the one that I should be following. And immediately went over and began attaching himself to Jesus. And he goes and gets his brother. Hey, Peter, we've been talking about this. You've heard about John the Baptist, and he's preaching the Messiah's coming. Well, guess what? The Messiah is here. Come and see. Come and meet this Messiah. There is a key point for everybody who's in church. It's our role not to win people. It's our role not to uh, debate people. It's not our role to prove this right or that wrong and, and to know every truth and solve every argument. That's not our role. We shouldn't even strive to have that as our role. Our role should be to connect people to God. Well, God moves in our church. God has moved. God has saved. God has changed people. God has worked miracles. 
Come and see. You don't think so? Come and see. Come and see what God will do in your life. Come and see if God will save your marriage. Come and see if God will answer your prayer. Come and see, amen, if your life will change. Come and see what he God was a relational evangelist. He wanted to connect people together. He wanted them to uh, be together. And so he didn't try to answer the questions. He wanted to um, connect them. He wanted them to know Jesus, to hear Jesus, to see Jesus, to experience Jesus. Yes, I think Jesus was an experience. I think, um, and, and you can see this, I don't have time to go over all the examples, but there are many examples of people who met Jesus and had a life change. I'm, I'm going to give all the money back that I stole. I'm going to pay it back. I'm going to come and follow you. The rich man comes to him and, and says, uh, I've done everything I should do. What do I need to do to 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 find eternal life. And he says, go sell all you have. So they had different experiences, but people were changed by that experience. And people are changed by coming to church. People are changed by hearing the gospel preached. People are changed by coming to an altar. People are changed by being filled with the Holy Ghost. I was changed. You're changed, amen, by your experience in God. Don't underestimate the power of being in the presence of God, the power of being underneath the Word of God and hearing the Word of God come and speak into your soul. It changes us. That's the reason people, when they start to get cold, they start avoiding church. They avoid that opportunity to change. They avoid that opportunity for the soul to get washed. They want to enjoy the pleasures of sin, and so they stay away from preaching that might convict or uh, call out to lift up. They don't want to be lifted up. They want to live the way they live, and uh, they try to avoid the church. And uh, it's not unusual. If somebody begins to backslide, their church attendance goes way down. Why? Because they want to avoid that. They want to avoid conviction. They want to avoid an altar. They want to avoid uh, saying, I need to change. I need to be different. They want to avoid heaven rejoicing at their repentance. And so they pull away and pull away and pull away and try to find the best way to um, step away from the church. You can see it many, many times. Andrew was trying to connect get people to meet Jesus if they could just meet Jesus. If they could just come in contact with his presence, they'll have a life change. Uh, Andrew was called, Matthew 4, Mark 1, Luke 5, John 1. Uh, there's two records here. Jesus was walking on the shore, saw Simon, Andrew, James, and John fishing, and he calls them, I'm going to make you fishers of men. Preached about this a few months ago. John records, though, the first thing about Andrew was he brought Simon to Jesus. So there's two different records. Uh, I'm not sure they're competing. It may be that Simon left and began to follow Jesus, found his brother, brought him, introduced him to Jesus, but they didn't become full-time disciples. And so they went back home and uh, went back to the fishing business and thought, well, he's here. It's really a great day of rejoicing. But I'm maybe not going to be following him day by day by day. And then Jesus comes by the Sea of Galilee. They're out fishing, uh, washing their nets after fishing. And he calls to them, come and follow me. And they leave everything. They leave mom and dad and, and their family, their livelihood, and they follow Jesus. It really does impact you and me and other people that much if they'll come to church. Don't don't bring someone to church and expect them not to be touched. Be willing to have the conversation. Be willing to have the conversation about what they felt, what's going on in their life. If God moves, be willing. Don't force it, but be willing to have that conversation. And allow the Lord to lead and guide you and connect people to Jesus. Andrew was also um, the one that brought the Savior, the little boy who had a lunch. And the loaves and fishes miracle. The little boy had it. And people were hungry. Jesus is looking around and telling people to sit down. And the little boy comes up and says, I have a couple of fish and a few loaves of bread. And he goes to Andrew. There's nothing that happens in Scripture that's accidental. Why go to Andrew? It's very likely that Andrew was just a warm, friendly person. 
he was maybe on the edge. Maybe he was not in the center, not trying to get on the throne next to Jesus, not trying to be seen. But maybe he's on the fringe, and he was helping, and he was serving in some way, and uh, he smiled. He was warm and friendly. Somehow, he caught this little lad's attention, or he saw the little lad and was aware, and uh, uh, went to him and had a conversation. The little boy said, well, I've got this. I'm willing to share. And so he connected the little boy to Jesus, and this unknown small child becomes a part of a miracle. Andrew's there. Andrew's the connect point between the two. And I think that God makes connect points and uses people as connect points. Again, you don't even have to be super spiritual. It ain't super spiritual to say, come and see. Come and see what the Lord has done. Come and see. This has touched my heart. The sermons, the, the music, the worship, the prayer. This has touched my heart. Why don't you come and see what God could do in your life? And so he connects them. And then finally, the third example out of Andrew's life is uh, at the very end of Jesus' ministry. He's headed towards Jerusalem, and he's headed towards the cross, and it's just a few short days before he faces the cross. And the Bible says in John 12, 20, the Greeks came to see Jesus at the feast in Jerusalem, the last feast. And it doesn't say that they were converts. It's possible they were proselytized Greeks. So they were trying to become Jews or already in the process of becoming Jews. Or maybe they were only uh, Jewish um, in their belief system. We don't know. At least they were religious, even if they were just Greeks and not converts, which is probably more likely. They uh, recognized that it was Passover time, and they came to worship in Jerusalem at the Passover. This is a significant thing. Uh, the Passover is exclusively a Jewish event. You can't get into the temple area proper unless you're Jewish, unless you're circumcised. You could be killed for going onto the temple mount proper and inside the walls of the temple mount if you have not been circumcised. So very likely the best they could do was stand on the outside of the walls and maybe worship, maybe just watch, maybe just look through the open doors. It doesn't say, but it is very significant that they were there. And it's possible that they'd heard about Jesus and were drawn to Jerusalem because they wanted to meet Jesus. And so they, were, they had their antenna up. They were looking to hear if Jesus was going to show up or not. And if he did, then they wanted to connect with him. And so they show up. And again, Andrew's the one they meet. Andrew is the one that they find a connect point with. Let's, uh, let's meet the Savior. We've come from a long distance. We've traveled far. We, we have just a short time. The Passover is coming and everybody's doing things. Can we see him now? We want to get in. We want to say hi. We want to know who he is. We want to know more about him. And so it's Andrew and then Philip. They connect with those and bring them into Jesus. Now Jesus uses this strategically. He begins to preach that uh, if I be lifted up, all men will be drawn to me. Now, it's certain that the disciples didn't really realize what that meant because Peter in Acts chapter 10 is still trying to figure that out, and it takes an angel and a vision from heaven for him to begin to understand that God wanted to open the doors of salvation to non-Jews and that Gentiles were going to get to come into the kingdom of God without becoming circumcised Jews. And that was a real revelation still in Acts chapter 10. But in this moment, Jesus used this opportunity of the Greeks wanting to see him, wanting to know him, to preach that message. He is, uh, uh, obviously it doesn't go over the conversation that he had with the Greeks but he was open and welcoming, it seems, to have them come and join with him so they could be part of the kingdom of God. Jesus had said, Matthew 28, 19 through 20, Go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, which is Jesus. He is the, the name of the Father is Jesus, the name of the Son is Jesus, and the Holy Spirit comes in the name of Christ. And uh, Jesus said, the Spirit that's in me will dwell in you. Uh, I'm not going to be just with you, I'm going to be in you. 
So that spirit that dwelled inside of him, um, you could call Jesus, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. So there is some obedience that is required, at least according to Jesus, that's required of us as we come into the kingdom of God. We must be born again. We must have the nature of Christ. I want to ask you, though, will you do that? Will you go? I don't mean to Africa. I mean to your neighbor. I mean to your friend that's having marital trouble. To the person that you know that's on drugs. Will you offer? Just offer? Come and see. God can change your life. God can wash away your sins. God can give you a brand new hope and a brand new life. Really? Got questions? Why don't you just come and see? I can't answer all your questions. That's not my job. But I tell you what, if you'll come and see, you'll be amazed at what God will do in your life. If you can just believe that there is a God, and even if you can't, come and see anyway. You might surprise yourself and just find God waiting on you and the God that you've been looking for to be the God that you really need in your life. Come and see. So, one last time. Do you do it? Would you do it? You certainly can do it, because all you've got to do is say, come and see. I've got a Savior who changed my life, who works in my soul, and I've seen him work in other people's lives. Don't believe it? Well, just come and see. Come and see what God will do with your life. Thank you for joining me and uh, being in Bible study tonight. It's an honor and a privilege to serve him with you. Love you greatly. Praying for you that you be strengthened. Can't wait to see you Sunday. This Sunday, May the 17th at 10 o'clock, we're doing one service, no children's ministry, no Sunday school classes, just one service, at least for May. That's what we're going to do. Uh, and sometime, hopefully in June, we'll be able to come back and have children's ministry. We're, we're listening to our government and reading the CDC information and watching the numbers in Elkhart County, trying to determine uh, how we can do it safely. This is a very serious disease, and it has killed friends of mine. And so we don't want to rush in. And I don't want you to be fearful because we're healthy. Everybody in our church, I think, is healthy uh, and doesn't have at least COVID-19. But we do want to caution you if you're elderly or if you're ill and firmed uh, or if you're running a fever and you feel sick, please, please self-manage and stay home. We'll be streaming service. You should be able to see it at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning if our technical stuff works. Um, and if not, we'll upload it, and it'll be up on uh, YouTube, and we'll send out a link to everybody as quickly as we can get it uploaded. Thanks again for joining with us. Love you, praying for you, and uh, look forward to seeing you on Sunday at 10 o'clock. God bless.